now let's look at reporting from the lessor perspective so as we've already discussed the lease could either have been classified as a operating lease or as a finance lease for an operating lease the lessor simply reports the revenue when earned so for example if the lessor has leased an asset for three years and every every year let's say that he receives thousand now even if he receives the thousand at the start of a year the revenue will be recognized when the machine has been used for the full year so the revenue will be recognized at the end of the year or the end of the period as the case may be we report the leased asset on the balance sheet this means that even though the asset is not being used by the lessor so this refers to the lessor the asset has been given for or rented to the lessee so the lessee is using the asset but the asset will remain on the books of the lessor so essentially this is a rental and the money coming in is rental revenue and obviously the expense is uh, is basically the depreciation expense so every year the appropriate depreciation expense shows up on the income statement of the lessor so the accounting treatment is quite simple if the lease is classified as a finance lease and that happens if any of the criteria that we talked about earlier hold plus we also need to take into account revenue recognition criteria and if you don't remember this i'd encourage you to go back to the reading on the income statement so there we will see revenue recognition for leased assets uh, and essentially revenue can be recognized upfront if you are reasonably confident of receiving the payments in the future if you can't be reasonably sure then you cannot book the entire revenue but if you've forgotten go back and listen to the lecture on the income statement again within finance leases us gap allows you to distinguish between what's called direct finance leases and sales type leases under ifrs there is no distinction but let's just understand these two terms in a little more detail so the difference between a direct finance lease and a sales type lease is as follows with a direct finance lease the present value of the lease payments is equal to the carrying value of the leased asset so in a finance lease by the way as you've already you know seen earlier in a finance lease the asset so if this is the lessor and this is the lessee the asset comes off the books of the lessor and it is placed on the books of the lessee now essentially this is like treating this whole transaction like a sale we call this a direct finance lease if let's say that the value of the asset was 100 and the present value of all the cash flow that will be received from the lessee if the present value of the cash flow is also equal to 100 then the lease classifies as a direct finance lease so what is essentially happening here is the lessor is making money based on financing so his revenue is basically interest revenue he is not making money because of selling the asset for a value that is greater than his carrying value so the core point to remember is if the lease payments present value of lease payments is equal to the carrying value of the leased asset then we classify this as a direct finance lease and in this case the lessor earns interest revenue so the money that he is getting in is uh the lease payments and the part of this that is interest essentially is his revenue or interest revenue and at inception what we do is record a lease receivable so at inception effectively what is happening is our asset so let's say our equipment which is an asset goes down and the other asset which is your lease receivable this goes up 
so that's the accounting for a direct finance lease sales type lease is one where the present value of the lease payments are greater than the carrying value of the leased assets so let's say that again the carrying value of the leased asset is say 100 but the present value of the leased payments equals 120 so here we would call this a sales type lease essentially the le the lessor is again selling the asset to the lessee and he is also providing financing on the lease so what will the what will the accounting entry be over here so the equipment that is being sold that is going down by 100 so your equipment which is an asset uh, so this is an asset account this goes down by 100 and the lease receivable which is an asset goes up by 120 and the 20 profit essentially because you have sold at a price higher than the cost of goods sold or higher than the carrying value the equity also goes up by 20 so here money is made in two ways one is through this uh, gain where uh, the amount of revenue booked is greater than the carrying value and then over the period of the lease the interest received is also a source of revenue and again to clarify IFRS essentially treats all leases as sales type leases and if the if the present value is equal to the carrying value then essentially we are saying that the equity goes up by zero and the revenue is coming from interest if the present value is higher than the carrying value then we make this money and also money from interest revenue US gap distinguishes between these two types of leases let's do a quick example from the lessor perspective and let's do this with a direct financing lease so let's say you are a lessor and you lease a machine to a lessee for four years and you receive thousand at the start of every year the relevant interest rate let's say is 10 percent so what are the accounting entries that we will need now what happens again i have made this example slightly different from what you might see in some study notes uh, many study notes to keep the simple make the payment at the end of a period but as i stated in an earlier lecture mostly with leases payments are made right at the start of every period so let's do this example with the assumption that payment is made at the start of every period so in this case again like we saw earlier so we have the machine being used for one two three four years and the payments of thousand are coming in at the start of every year so the final payment will happen at the start of year four which is the same as end of year three now what is the present value of all this the present value again you can put your calculator in begin mode and calculate the present value which will be 3487 again we are rounding to the nearest whole number here so this then is the present value of the payments to be uh, received now what happens in our um, example so let's say that all these numbers here refer to what's happening right at the beginning of the year so let's say all this initially refers to 1st January on 1st January of the first year so that would be at this point we receive the lease payment of 1000 so that reduces the lease receivable now what was this present value 3487 initially will go down as lease receivable equal to 3487 and we are assuming here that the carrying value of our asset was also 3487 which is why we are calling this a uh, direct financing lease so when we sell this asset the carrying value of the asset is removed from the balance sheet and right you know morning of january 1st we record a lease receivable of 3487 and then the payment of 1000 comes in let's say in the afternoon on 1st January of the first year 
and that reduces our least receivable by 1000 and our least receivable after receiving this 1000 is 3487 minus the 1000 which is 2487 so this is our least receivable by end of day 1st January of the first year and what's the interest for the first year the interest that we will show as revenue interest revenue in the first year will be 10% of this uh, uh, of this value which would be 249 so in our income statement for the first year we will show interest revenue of 249 then in the second year right up front so that's over here end of first year beginning of second year again we'll receive a payment of 1000 now what is the reduction in lease receivable the reduction in lease receivable is going to be 751 where do we get this 751 from the way you can think of this is as follows that the total payment now received is 1000 of this 1000 the interest component was 249 so 1000 minus 249 is equal to 751 so our lease receivable goes down by 751 so essentially we are saying that for this payment of 1000 which corresponds to this one of this 249 was interest and then the remaining must have been principal which reduces the lease receivable from 2487 down to 1736 so that is our new lease receivable and all this remember as I mentioned earlier all this is happening on 1st January or the first day of the period so this is happening on the first day of the second year and then the interest would be 10% of this number which is 174 then third year right at the beginning of the third year again we'll receive a payment of 1000 so that now corresponds to this number the reduction in lease receivable is now going to be 826 where did this number come from so we are saying that the payment that we are receiving is 1000 of this 1000 the interest component is 174 so 1000 minus 174 is equal to 826 so the lease receivable should go down by 826 so from 1736 we go down to 910 and then what is the interest for the year for the third year the interest for the third year is 10 percent of this which is 91 and then again beginning of the fourth year we again receive thousand so now this refers to the payment received at the beginning of the fourth year the reduction in lease receivable is now 910 approximately and our lease receivable after getting this payment of 910 is zero and the interest that we book as revenue in the fourth year is zero so in our particular example interest shown as revenue in the interest revenue in year one is 249 year two 174 year three 91 so this shows how we account for um, shows how we account for leases in uh, assuming a direct financing lease now we are essentially done with the discussion on leases but in case your head is spinning i would advise you to look at exhibit 2 in the curriculum which is on page 537 for the 2011 curriculum this really summarizes the whole discussion on leases very well and for your benefit i am going to summarize this for you too
when you are dealing with leases, the first thing is to consider whether you are taking the lessee perspective or the lessor perspective. So the lessee is the company that is using the asset. Now, with a lessee perspective, we can either have an operating lease or a finance lease. So let's say with a lessee perspective, we first assume we have a operating lease. With the operating lease on the balance sheet, there is no effect. And on the income statement, basically what is happening is there is uh, the lessee reports a uh, rent expense. So this shows up as a operating expense which will reduce the so operating profit will go down the net profit will go down and so on and basically on the cash flow statement basically this is a cash flow from operations and so the CFO will go down if this is treated like a, uh, so so if this is treated like a finance lease by the lessee so on the finance lease what happens is that we essentially assume that the asset comes on the books of the lessee so asset value goes up liability value goes up based on the present value of the lease payments on the income statement we report the depreciation expense plus the interest expense and on the cash flow statement we basically the reduction in the lease liability is considered uh, financing cash flow and the other part interest portion of the lease payment can be treated as either operating or financing under IFRS and under US GAAP it is treated as a uh, operating cash flow so I'll just summarize this as finance slash operating so this is stated very nicely in exhibit 2 as I mentioned earlier so this is the treatment from a lessee perspective and again another quick point is that distinguishing between operating and financing lease essentially if the lessee is using the asset for most of the life or the present value of the payments are essentially close to the value of the asset then we treat this as a finance lease. There are a couple of other reasons but we have already been through those in detail. Then if you take the lessor perspective, again we can either have an operating lease or a finance lease. So if this is an operating lease, then the asset remains on the balance sheet. So we keep the asset on the balance sheet of the lessor and, and um, the income statement reports the uh, so reports the revenue so whatever money is coming in is reported as revenue and on the cash flow statement we basically show money as cash flow from operations so that will go up if we treat this as a finance lease then within finance lease according to us gap we can either have something called a direct finance lease or a sales type lease with a direct finance lease the present value of all the cash flow is equal to the carrying value and with a sales type lease the present value is greater than the carrying value so in these cases so under finance lease the asset is essentially being sold so the asset comes off the balance sheet so asset is removed from the balance sheet and we recognize a lease receivable on the income statement we show uh, as our uh, so the revenue that shows up on the income statement depends on whether this is a direct finance lease or a sales type lease but in a direct finance lease every year the interest coming in is shown as our revenue and obviously if we have a sales type lease then how much we sell this for is shown as our revenue in terms of the CFO the interest portion of the lease payment received is either an operating or investing cash flow under IFRS uh, 
and uh, operating cash flow under US GAAP whereas the receipt of leasing principal is a uh, investing cash flow so that is the general idea over here again I'd encourage you to look at this exhibit now finally we are coming towards the end of this long reading let's talk a little bit about pension this is also an example of a non current liability broadly speaking there are two kinds of pension plans one is called a defined contribution plan and the other is a defined benefit plan a defined contribution plan is easy to account for or relatively easy to account for in this plan the company basically tells its employees that every month it's going to contribute a certain amount so just as a simple example per employee let's say they are going to receive dollars hundred as their contribution so this is simplistic but the idea is that the amount the company is contributing every month is defined it's agreed upon and that is shown as a uh, expense an operating expense and uh, operating cash flow so accounting for this is easy because it shows up in every period as a uh, expense based on the amount that is agreed upon and paid so that's our simple defined contribution plan a defined benefit plan is much harder to account for in a defined benefit plan the company is essentially promising some benefits to the employees so for example the benefit might be a percentage of salary on on retirements it might be health benefits etc etc so there might be benefits where the benefit is defined but what is not clearly known at the time is what will the cost of these benefits be so several assumptions need to go into figuring out what is the cost of the defined benefit plan but broadly speaking in every period uh, there are certain costs that need to be allocated and we will study this in a lot more detail in level 2 of the CFA but at this stage I think it's sufficient for you to just understand these five terms that constitute the core components of uh, costs in every period one is called the service cost so this represents the present value of the benefits earned during the current period so for all the employees who are working and for whom the company needs to pay pension at a future time the present value of the pension benefit that the company needs to pay these employees where which is based on what is earned during a given period shows up as service cost interest cost is the increase in the liability due to passage of time actuarial gains and losses are any changes in the uh, any changes in the pension obligation because of changes in uh, actuarial assumptions changes to pension plan that increase the obligation so for example if the company decides that rather than paying 50 percent of salary as pension it will now pay 60 percent of salary as pension so any changes to the obligation because of changes in the pension plan that is another component of the obligation or the cost and finally something that offsets these costs is the expected return on plan assets essentially what companies do is in order to meet this future obligation the company will create a pension fund of sorts and this normally is done through uh, through a, a third party but this pension fund will have all sorts of assets stocks bonds etc etc so the return that we are getting on this uh, on the plan assets are, are meant to offset the expenses simplistically put the idea is that the plan assets will grow in the future to meet the pension obligation again this is very simplistically put I don't think you need to get into too much detail and if you do want the detail then we can discuss this when you are preparing for the level 2 exam just one more slide on pensions so again this is in the context of the 
defined benefit plans the requirement uh, or actually let's first understand some basic terminology for a pension plan uh, there is an important concept of the funded status so the value of the funded status is plan assets minus defined benefit obligation so plan assets is the value of the assets that the company has that are set aside to cover the future obligations let's say that the value of the plan assets is currently 100 million defined benefit obligation simplistically put so this is the present value of the future pension related obligations so if the present value of the future obligations let's say is 110 million so this is saying that we have what is called a underfunded plan where our assets are equal to 100 million the present value of the obligation so these are the commitments that the company has made to its employees and based on several assumptions we calculate what those the, the monetary value of those commitments discount them back to the present and let's say we get a number of 110 million so the funded status here is minus 10 million and essentially this then is saying that the plan is underfunded and as a side note this is actually quite a major issue in uh, in the United States currently where several pension plans are underfunded which will potentially create issues in the future but nevertheless uh, funded status is positive if the plan assets are greater than the defined benefit obligation under US gap when companies report pension related obligations they must report what's called the funded status on the balance sheet under IFRS firms can remove unrecognized smooth actuarial gains losses and unrecognized prior service costs from the funded status hence it is possible that the balance sheet amount does not reflect economic reality so with US gap we can be quite confident that the funded status is reflecting economic reality but under IFRS since certain unrecognized smooth items can be removed we do not necessarily reflect economic reality so from an analysis perspective it is generally easier to study the numbers reported in the US gap with IFRS we have to go study footnotes and disclosures in a lot of detail now don't be worried if you did not understand this hundred percent as long as you just got the general idea and remember the core terms I think for level one you should be more than covered in level two there is a huge reading on this whole topic and I am sure you will get the necessary details then and the final point on pension is that companies must disclose components of the benefit obligation plan assets pension expense and they must also disclose any assumptions that have gone into the numbers evaluating the solvency of a company so this essentially talks about evaluating whether a company will be able to meet long-term debt obligations both in terms of repayments of principal as well as repayments of interest there are two kinds of solvency ratios leverage ratios as well as coverage ratios leverage ratios and again you've seen this before and almost every chapter has uh, has some important ratios at the end of it but you saw this earlier in the chapter on financial reporting and analysis but you have ratios like debt to assets debt to capital and so on debt to equity so all these ratios you need to understand and if these ratios are high that means that the leverage is high companies have taken on too much debt and these ratios need to be looked at in the context of other comparable companies in the industry financial leverage refers to assets divided by equity and again if if a company has taken on a lot of debt uh, 
then the equity number will be small relative to assets and the ratio will be high so that can be potentially dangerous if this leverage is too high compared to the industry the other kinds of ratios that are extremely important are called coverage ratios the most basic ratio is the interest coverage ratio which is ebit operating income divided by interest payments and this is something that you saw earlier but i told you that we will see this you will understand it better later well the later has now arrived we are now aware of the fact that companies make lease payments these lease payments while they are not interest payments but they are still obligations so we need to worry about not just whether companies will be able to meet their interest payments we also need to worry about their ability to meet these obligations the obligations to make lease payments and the relevant ratio here is called the fixed charge ratio so in the regular interest coverage ratio the numerator is earnings before interest and taxes so remember for leases especially operating leases the operating rent or the lease rent is subtracted in order to come to to arrive at ebit we add back the lease payment so essentially what we then have is earnings before interest tax and lease payments so collectively this there is no real term like this but effectively what this thing in the circle is is uh, earnings before interest tax and lease payments because we are adding back the lease payments divided by the total interest payment plus lease payment so this is an interest coverage ratio that has taken into account our lease obligations and the higher this ratio the better so that is it in terms of the content for this very long reading now here is a quick request for you i would like to get your feedback on this as well as other lectures if you like this lecture just click on the like tab if you have any comments about how this lecture could be made better please put those comments right below the lecture and then that will help me make improvements in the future and finally if you want to get the most out of this then you must practice as much as possible do the 15 or 16 questions in the curriculum do as many questions from your study notes and only when you do questions will this material really sink in